Wow. Isn't that amazing to sit in the cinema again? It How seems long like is that ago? It seems like centuries ago when I we know. have been. Do you I remember know. cinemas? What it is? <laughs> do you still remember the red chairs? No. We've been there we, one time. Oh, it really smells like cinema. Mm, oh. cinema. We like cinema. And you know, I love it when I see a movie and it's so emotional and I go with it and I cry and I laugh. And you know, sometimes I don't really get the plot. For example, for with the James Bond, for me, it's much too complicated sometimes. I, I think. Why is always the Russian guy the bad guy? Or why is always, uh, what, what is the cousin to do with the uncle? And why is they coming from there with the plane? And so please, Toby, can you, can you explain me? Yeah, a lot of questions. So when, when, when we've been in cinemas, it was like this. Uh, Frogo will ask me during the movie, uh, what's going on? And I try to explain here, but no, not, not everybody in the movie theater likes it. Somebody said, psst, silent, don't be so loud. Okay, so it's not always good in cinema to talk about it, so... So for us it's good to have these on-demand things, where yes. you can stop can and then stop, you can talk and, you know... Talk about yeah. it, what was the point, why are the Russians the bad guys and so on. So, <laughs> oh. so not always... Oh, <laughs> not bad guys. Only in that movie. <laughs> Only in that movie. Yeah. So, but sometimes in, in the faith it seems like we, we, we lost sometimes the track, we don't know... We don't know what's the point again. When we read the Bible, maybe for the first time, or again and again, especially the Old Testament, we think sometimes, I don't understand the faith. What's going on? So today we want to talk about this topic. And how it's like a red thread through the Bible. And if you want, I want to pray with you that today you will get a little uh, a glimpse of what the Bible has to do with your life and what our God plans are. So Jesus, I thank you so much that we, that we are here and that you say that we are sheep who hear your voice. And I ask you to explain everyone here and on the screen what is important for him, for her, what is the plot from the Bible which re refers to our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So we are in the hashtag Jesus series, uh, as you know, maybe, maybe it's the first time today here on the online stream. Uh, but we talk about like, what is the point, especially in the Old Testament, because sometimes we read it, as I said to you, and we don't know what's going on. And I tell you now a sentence Jesus said about the Old Testament, uh, especially in Jesus' time, he only, only had the Old Testament. The New Testament was written after Jesus was on this earth. The, the first Christian, they only had the Old Testament. And for Christians, sometimes it's really tough because we think the Old Testament, we don't want to read it sometimes. It's long, sometimes it's so cruel. I don't know. All this offering, all this blood, what's going on. So sometimes Christians only buy Bibles with the Psalms, maybe yeah, the prophets, but the rest of the books we don't like so much sometimes because we think, what's going on? And Jesus is telling us something about the Old Testament. He's telling us there are the very, very scriptures that testified about me. He's telling us, that the Old Testament is testifying about Jesus. If you believe Moses, though he wrote the first five books in the Bible, you would believe in me, for he wrote about me. When you see this the first time, you think, maybe you know a little bit about the first five books in the Bible, and you think, why is Moses writing about Jesus? He's talking about, like, creation was made by God, and then Father Abraham, and then... All his children, and then uh, it talks about the tabernacle and the offering and the blood, and you need the lamp, and then the ox. And so, uh, uh, where's Jesus there? I don't know. And sometimes it's a little bit like uh, confusing. Why is the Old Testament talking about Jesus, and where, especially in the first five books of the Bible? There's a situation uh, when Jesus was died and he res was uh, resurrected, he walked after the walls with two disciples to Emmaus. And he was talking about them for hours about the Old Testament and he was explaining them everything in the Old Testament about him. Some people say this sermon t uh, took uh, nine hours. So it teached about nine hours to two people about the Old Testament and what's all about him. I think it was the most amazing sermon ever. Only two people were visiting. So it was crazy. So he was talking about this 
read thread through the Bible. So we want to see it, especially in the Old Testament, in the hashtag Jesus series this time, because sometimes we say a picture says more than a thousand words. If we go in this picture of the Old Testament about the tabernacle, about all the covenant things, and today we talk about pre pri priesthood, so about the priests, and it's a picture for you and me what is our calling when we follow Jesus. So we will see it in the first part of the Bible about the priests. So the priests, they had clothes, they had garments, and everything has a meaning in the Old Testament. Because God told Moses everything especially which color he has to use for the garment of the priest, um, what they have to use, uh, what they have to do, everything very, in very much details, he to tells, told them what to do. And the first thing is the priest, before he went uh, on his business to pray for the people, to pray for the country, to pray for the people of God, first of all, he has to make his own offering for himself that he was cleansed because he took the white garment of a priest and then he was ready. So in a picture for us, it means that we can go to Jesus and ask him to invite him in your life. And this is the first step of your calling. I don't know if you have done this before, but if you invite Jesus in your life, it means that you become a son and a daughter of God. So the first step before a priest goes in the presence of God, he first cleanses himself in this picture today, we take the cross in our life and we are ready as sons, as daughters to go in the presence of God. But this is not the only goal. It's an amazing goal. And today I want to pray with you. If you never prayed this prayer before to invite Jesus in your life, today I will pray with you. But this is the first step of your calling, to be a son and a daughter of God. But this is not the end goal for God for you because he says, now we go on. You are called to be Priests, I tell you now, uh, I, take, I take a scripture, and it's in uh, First Peter, we see it. Um, you also like living stones are being built in a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, to Jesus Christ. So the Bible is telling us that we are priests when we are in the, uh, in the, in the atmosphere with God. So the second thing the, the high priest was doing he was changing once a year his clothes. And I, I show you a picture. And this was the clothes of the high priest. And every color is a symbol for what God is doing in our life. For example, like for example blue was the color for heavenly, to have a heavenly appointment by God. Purple scarlet was the, that you are a royal, royal priest. And so he was a royal, royal priest. And I tell you in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it's written, you, you are the chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness in this wonderful light. So the Bible is telling us we are a royal priesthood. What does it mean? We're not only son and daughters, only. It's a crazy. We're son and daughters. But we are a royal priesthood. What does it mean? Royal means you have authority. Priesthood means you can go in the presence of God, you can pray for people instead of them. You can help them to come, come to Jesus in, in the presence of God. And these are a different thing. And the third thing they had, the, the high priest, he has this golden um, thing on his breast. And there the names of the tribes was written on it. So over his heart, he had all the names of the tribes. And he was bringing his nation and these people to God. And I don't know if you know it, but Jesus is praying for you guys and for me. And the Bible is telling us that he is carrying your name and my name on his heart in the presence of God. Like the high priest, he has your name and my name and he's going in the presence of God. And the Bible is telling us that Jesus tells us that he uh, prayed for us. For example, he's telling us that he not, is not only prayed for us, but everybody who comes to faith through us, he prayed already. He said to Peter, I prayed for you before you were tempted. So Jesus is praying for us and he's carrying people on his heart. And when we follow Jesus as a royal priesthood, we can carry people on our heart as well. Frauke, so how do you carry people on your heart in the presence of God? Isn't that beautiful that Jesus carries your name and my name on his heart and that we can do that as well? that we belong to him. And I think this is just 
uh, a picture for intercession. What does it mean to pray for someone and to carry him in the presence of God? And that's how I do it. I have my little room and a little table and that's where I sit and where I pray and where I read my Bible. And there I have this wall and I have a few post-its on this wall and, uh, and it changes every now and then. And then there I put names. And every time I cross this wall with the, with the names, I think of them and then it feels for me like, okay, I have them on my heart. Or for example, um, I love all these messenger apps uh, like WhatsApp or Telegram and all the things where you can pin. Do you know that you can pin names uh, or um, contacts uh, on, the, on the top of, uh, of this, uh, this app? And that's what I do. For example, last year when I heard that Leo's mom died, I knew that it's really going to be a hard time for him and for Susanna and for the whole family and they have to lead a church and Simon is going to marry and all the things. And so that's a moment where I pin Leo and Susanna on the top of my messenger app and every time I open it, and it's very often that I open it a day, I see the name and then I, I, I don't make a holy moment like, oh, I have to pray, but it feels like, okay, Leo and Susanna are on my heart right now and I just bring them in the presence of God and pray, Jesus, please give them wisdom, give them trust yeah, that they don't be so sad anymore or show them everything they need. Or I don't know, maybe you have a single parent in your small group or around you or your neighbor. This is a person where you can, maybe you know there is a need and you can pin it and you can, you can just put her or him in the presence of God and carry him. And then it's, it's for some time, maybe a few weeks and then I put another person over there. Or when we have, um, uh, we have this big uh, placard, what is the name of Val placard? That was, I looked it up, but I don't find it. A poster, yeah, electric poster, something like that. When, when, uh, yeah, and uh, and we had a lot of them in Munich for uh, for um, many different politicians, and and uh, I drove through our city, and then I saw this one woman on this poster, and her name is Katrin Habenschaden. If you understand German, her last name means something like she has a damage and it really touched my heart because I felt like yeah someone hurt her and maybe something happened to her life like probably every one of us got hurt in our lives and so that was just every time I saw this picture of her I didn't know her but it felt like she was my sister or she was my friend and it doesn't it doesn't matter if I'm totally fine with her political uh, thoughts or um, opinions but that's the moment when I pray for her that every time she took a damage or something happened to her life that she will experience the love of God and that's just how I do it. And uh, let's, let's start praying for people and carry them on our hearts in the presence of God. Because this is, Corrie ten Boom once said that, the best thing you can do for a person is to pray for him. Thank you. So we are called to be son and daughters, to be king and queens, and to be priests. So three parts of our calling. So the high priest, he knew it was his identity. He didn't stand up and said, oh, today I don't feel like a high priest. I don't have so much faith today. Today I stay in bed. Okay, it's Yom Kippur. It's the most important day in the year. I could pray for the country. I could pray for all the tribes, but I stay at home. I don't feel like. In Christianity, we think about a lot of our feelings. One day we stand up and we feel strong. We feel faith and we pray. The next day, we don't feel. So we don't know we are called to be royal priesthood. So we can pray every day. We have authority because Jesus is living in us, not because we feel like Jesus is inside of me when I live with Jesus and I have the Holy Spirit to pray. And the Bible is telling us that we should pray for politicians, polit politi politicians, not against. A lot of Christians pray against people. 
The Bible is telling me we pray for people, but against spirits. Something totally different. Against spirit, about the spirit of control, manipulation, whatever. Uh, against the spirit of control. You can pray against spirit, but for people. And so the, the royal priest, he has on his heart, his love, he's loving people. And he, start, he doesn't say one day, oh, I have these different names of the tribes of Israel. So I like Dan. He's a great tribe, a great man. I would love, I love to pray for him. But I don't like Judah. I don't, I don't like his politician's point of view. I don't like the party he's voting. I don't like him. He doesn't do it. You know, I bring everybody in the presence of God. How would Switzerland look like if every Christian would go through Zurich and the Holy Spirit could tell you every day what kind of people you could bring on your heart in the presence of God? Maybe you walk through the city, you see maybe a store, a cinema who's closed. Maybe you pray for the guy who's owning this company. Or uh, there's an election going on and you see all these uh, posters about the parties, you don't pray against people, for people, but against spirits. I think Switzerland would be changed if we know we are not only son and daughters. We are royal priests in the presence of God. So the high priest is doing instead of the, he's praying instead of the people in the presence of God. And I, I took some uh, Bible verses for you. You can uh, make, me, make, make a picture and make a, a Bible study at home because I don't have time for all this uh, scriptures, but through the whole Bible, Bible is a representative prayer in the Bible. So somebody is praying instead of somebody else or a country or people in the presence of God. Moses did it, Daniel did it, Nehemiah did it, King David, Job did it, and so on. In the second part of the Bible, we see that Jesus is doing it as, as well. He was dying on the cross, and I have a question for you. Do you think when Jesus was dying on the cross, do you think he had time for senseless prayer on the cross? The last prayer he did, a senseless prayer. It doesn't make sense and it wasn't important. No, I don't think so. I think his last prayer, his last prayer was very important. So maybe you know the prayer. I read to you, Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't, do not know what they are doing. He's asking for forgiveness instead of the people. He's not praying, God, I ask you that one day when, they pe when these people will repent and go to the cross, that you will forgive them then. He's asking instead of the people for forgiveness. That's crazy. We have Stephen in Acts, and it's just a few seconds before he was dying because uh, they took stones and they throw after him. And we see in Acts, uh, the following verse, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. So he is praying like Jesus prayed, like a high priest instead of the people. Why are they doing this? Of course, everybody has to come to Jesus by himself or herself one day. But sin is destroying your life. And when these guys don't have the possibility right now by themselves to talk, go to the cross, you, the Christian, can go instead of the people to God and pray for them that they will be open one day to come to Jesus by themselves. So the high priest is doing this once a year, especially at Yom Kippur. He's going in the presence of God, and I want to go, come with you in this feeling the uh, people of Israel had once a year. So... Just imagine for your inner eyes or in your imagination that we are now in the desert of Israel. So we are the people of Israel. I will play the high priest and you know now is Yom Kippur. I will go in the tabernacle and I will pray for you guys. I already, already did an offering for myself because I'm a sinner as well. But now I go in the presence of God and you know what I will do? Once in a year, once in a year I will go instead for you to ask God forgiveness for the last year in your life. I don't talk about yesterday, last year, the whole year. All sins of your life, okay? That's crazy. So, are you ready, people of Israel? You're in the desert? Okay. So I go now in the tabernacle. You know what I'm doing. You don't see it because when I go to this door here, you don't see me anymore. But you know, I will go in the presence of God and it's totally silence 
in the desert because everybody is thinking by themselves, what did I do last year? What did I think? What did I say? What did I do? Everybody knows in the desert that we are sinners and that we need forgiveness. We're sitting there, we're standing there, we're very silent because we can't do anything. We would love to do something. We would love maybe to spend money to give an offering or to work in church just to feel better, just to do something because we feel guilty. We know we need forgiveness, but we can't do anything. We're standing there, we're waiting, and we're very silent because we know when the high priest will go in the tabernacle, he will change his clothes. And we know this point because when he will change his clothes on his garment, there was little bells. So when you hear this, you know, now he was changing his clothes. It means he will go now in the presence of God, the Holy of the Holiness, and he will take uh, an animal for us instead of us who will be killed and he will ask God for forgiveness. We're waiting. We're silent. We're nervous because we don't know, will he come out again? And when he comes out, will he tell us that we are, we are forgiven? If yes, this will be the biggest party of the year because we know this is grace. It's only amazing grace that God will forgive you. So we listen because when the bell will be going louder and louder, we know he will come to the door and we will come out. So what will be his message be? And he comes out and he said, You are forgiven again, one another year. You are forgiven, people of God. And what is going on in the desert? They will party because the poor people of Italy, they know how to party. We don't know it in Switzerland, but we know it in the Bible. Why are they partying all the time? Because they know I was sitting in the desert. I didn't do anything for forgiveness. That's only grace. A lot of people who know God are not thankful for grace because sometimes we think we earned it. When you are outside in the desert, you know, you earned nothing. You, you, you waited outside, you can't do anything. And now you experience that God is forgiving you. It's only grace. And this is really one of the biggest miracles that God is doing this for us. So, Frauke, how can we do it in our families? As yes, priests. for us, or for me, it's always very important to ask the question, yes, but how? This is a great theology and we, wow, Jesus did that and Stephanos did that or Stephen and how can we do that now? And um, I introduce you a family and Clemens is here with uh, his wife, Michi. And Clemens is the CEO of ICF Munich. So he and his wife are very important for us in Munich and we go through thick and thin and we, um, yeah, lead church together. And they have three sons, Nicholas and uh, Robin and Leon, and they experienced something last year. So let's go with me in their living room. Some time ago, you both had a very special or um, challenging situation in your family. Um, what happened? And then I know that we had a series at ICF, a preaching series, and the name was Prison Break. So you thought, oh, that feels like a prison. 
How can we break out? And then something happened in your mind. What was that? And for me, it was another situation in this prayer because God showed me uh, in a situation um, that happened really. So it was a conflict between Nicholas and me. We cried, we screamed, and it was very bam. And um, in this prayer, I recognized that I have to do, to ask for forgiveness. And the special prayer was um, that Clemens um, prayed, um, um, he prayed, uh, in, in, on, on behalf of Nicholas, um, I forgive you, mommy, and there's nothing between us anymore. And that was a powerful prayer. So, okay, but that's, that's it. That was the prayer. Uh, it's not, uh, we did not anything else. Uh. So it was just very rational or, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and what happened then? Yeah, it's crazy because uh, on the next day, but also on the, uh, in the days after that, um, we had another children. He was relaxed, he solved the conflict, he, he was in his family again, he liked to be with us, and it was really a breakthrough. It, it was really like this. Yeah. So he really changed like 180 yeah, yeah, degrees. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have three, boy, three boys, so it's also conflict, uh, <laughs> and they are, uh, make themselves angry against each other. Um, but it's another, um, kind of conflict and we can solve this conflict in another way. So there's mm -hmm. more freedom in yeah. this family now. Yeah. Wow, isn't that amazing? And, and, and I love how they also accepted the challenge to speak English. It really <laughs> costed them something, but I'm so proud of them. And um, I just want to repeat the steps they made because it's, uh, it's something every one of us can do. If you're a, a spiritual parent or a, a, a physical parent. First thing is to know your identity as a daughter or a son of God. And the second thing is you have authority. You are a royal priest. And that means that you have authority. And then you can go into situations and the, you can ask God, what do you want to do there? What is the problem? As they told uh, that Nicholas, the, Jesus showed a picture, what was his, his issue. And then you can pray on behalf of him. You, you, can, you can go to Jesus instead of this person and ask for forgiveness. And Michi told me that after that, she went to her little son and then she, she could ask him also for forgiveness and ask him, is everything fine again? Can we, can we start new? So the one thing was on behalf of him, she went to Jesus and then she, she solved the conflict on the physical side. So we go on behalf of people to Jesus because sometimes people don't know Jesus by their own. So they can't go to Jesus. So we can go instead for them to Jesus to pray for them or small children. The Bible is telling us in Ephesians, especially as parents, we have authority about our underage children. Or in uh, Numbers 30, we see that parents 
even when their children do something bad or decide a bad decision, we can pray instead of them, the Bible is telling us. So we can take the things that are destroying them in the spirit of warfare uh, over them, that they are protected and then they can go by themselves to God. So I don't know where you are tonight. Maybe you never received Jesus in your life. I will pray in a few seconds with you if you never received Jesus in your life. If you don't know how it feels to be a son and a daughter of God. And then Frauke will pray for you that you can decide for the first time or again that you receive this calling to be a royal priest. So I invite you to pray with us. Maybe we close our eyes because it's a personal moment between us and God. And if you feel today that you want to receive Jesus in your life, you can pray with me and say, Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for me. And as the people of Israel, when, when they've been in the desert, I can't do anything to, for, to receiving your grace. I just receive it now. I decide now that I receive your grace, that you died for me, that you forgive my sins. I thank you that you live inside of me from today on, that I can be your son, your daughter. I thank you that you call me home tonight. And if maybe for the first time or again, you want to receive the authority and you want to like really stand up, then I ask you to really stand up and put your hand on your heart and I'd love to pray for you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray over you that you are a royal priest, even though you don't feel it or if you don't see it, but this is the truth. Jesus says that he gives you authority. He lives in you and you can use this royal authority as a royal priest to go in your family or to your friends and make a difference because Jesus in his power is with you. Yeah. Amen.